When you are your authentic self, people can intrinsically feel that energy. Energy is palpable. Energy is real. Hello, it's Tony Howell, and I want to say thank you for listening to this podcast. This is our opportunity to have conversations with change makers, seeking the practical ways that we as artists can use our gifts to change this world. This month's guest is Grammy Award winning artist Nathan Lee Graham. His career spans film, television, theater, music, and more. He's currently starring on The CW as Francois in Katie Keene, and you'll also see NLG on the upcoming Hulu series, Woke. His feature films include Zoolander, Zoolander 2, Sweet Home Alabama, and Hitch. Additional TV credits include The Comeback, LA to Vegas, Scrubs, Absolutely Fabulous, and more. He made his Broadway debut in the original Tony and Grammy Award nominated cast of The Wild Party. And other theatrical credits include The View Upstairs, Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, Wig Out, and more. I am so excited and honored to have this conversation. And what you're about to hear is Nathan sharing the following. The importance of authenticity how to find and develop your voice, your essence, the rules of the industry, and a few lessons from his legendary mentor, Eartha Kitt, how to handle the world that we're living in, including politics and social media and more. I do wanna highlight that we tried very hard when recording this episode to get things set up from the technical side, but Nathan ended up having to phone in for this interview because he just moved into a new apartment and hadn't slept in 24 hours. So do uh, accept my apology for the audio quality. We did our absolute best and know that this episode is definitely still worth your listen. Enjoy. Thank you for being on the podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to talk to you. There's a lot I want to dive into. But just to kick us off, can you tell us what you're working on right now? Okay, so I'll give you an example of what happened last week. So I wrapped uh, a current show I'm doing for the CW called Katie Keene. Katie Keene is a spinoff of Riverdale, which is a part of the Archie comic world. Greg Berlanti, Roberto Sacasia Aguar, um, Aguar Sacasia rather, uh, and uh, Michael Grassi. So it's a wonderful show. It uh, it has music in it. It is uh, we actually sing and dance as well. It's kind of kooky and crazy. Um, it's otherworldly. You feel nostalgic. It's beautiful. So I wrapped that. I started. Let's say. Let's say I started at 2.42 my a.m. That was my call. 2.42 a.m., they picked me up. And then I shot until 3 p.m. the same day, but it feels different. <laughs> uh, and then I moved to my new apartment Tuesday morning. So that was a Monday, Tuesday morning. And then that afternoon, Tuesday afternoon, I was flown to Vancouver to shoot a new show on Hulu, a comedy called Woke. W-O-K-E. It was very funny. The weather in Vancouver was horrible, but um, the people there are lovely. Uh, We were shooting in the woods. Well, it seemed like the woods because it looked like The Shining. And uh, and I was like, what's happening with with me? But the but the copy, the the script woke was so hilarious. Um, I had such a good time. So uh, I shot that for a couple of days and I came back uh, um, on Friday morning, my show premiered Katie Keene Thursday evening, which we're supposed to, as a cast member, live tweet. So I was trying to sort of tweet when I was on the set of another show and then couldn't really do it. So I just sort of retweeted everyone's tweet and, um, and I couldn't watch the show obviously because I was at work. 
so um, in Canada, no less, on the other side of the of the of the continent, of the um, of the country. Well, not our country, but over there. And then, uh, and then I I flew back uh, Friday morning in a with in a fevered pitch because I had to host the 65th annual Viennese Opera Ball at Cipriani 42nd Street. So that's an example of what's been going on with me. Um, and, and here, A day in the life. Right. And of course, everything was delivered that Tuesday morning, except for my sofa, which is coming today. And I haven't been in my bed, my brand new bed. I haven't even been in it. So I just, I just put it together yesterday. Uh, what a whirlwind. Well, thank you for being on the show. And I, I want to rewind and go back, if you would. Can you talk about at what point in your early life that you knew that you were an artist? Wow, that's a good question. Well, here's the thing. Uh, I was born in St. Louis, but I grew up in Los Angeles. And then I went back to college in St. Louis. So and but I've lived most of my life in New York City. And there's not really been a point where I haven't been a part of show business, if you will. I mean, we started school, we started church, all those sort of things. I guess the, the bigger question for me would be, when did I decide to actually make this my vocation? Uh, when did I decide that I would make a living doing this and it really was sort of a foregone conclusion because my hobby became my profession um my parents my grandparents my parents always had me in something extracurricular and it just seemed it seemed very second nature and very natural so um there was no light bulb moment but there was a moment where I said to my mom, I would like to be, and I said these words, a working actor. I didn't say a star. I didn't say famous. I said a working actor. And I said that sometime in high school, uh, you know, um, before I went to college. And then, I, of course, I went to a conservatory, Webster Conservatory, where their whole theme was the working actor. Other conservatories do other things, but that was their sort of uh, motto. And I just happened to go to that school. So it just all sort of worked out. I wish it was a more glamorous way of, of putting it, but it was a foregone conclusion that I would be a part of the business. But it, uh, I mean, that I was in show business, that I was performative, an artist. But it was not a foregone conclusion that I would actually make a living at it. And so... That's the interesting thing for me. The twist in the road. Yeah, the and twist so in the road. So there wasn't a pivotal... No, there wasn't a pivotal moment because I'm still very reluctant. <laughs> um, even though I've never done anything else, uh, I've never waited on a table, which, you know, I think would be fun. You know, at least it would have been. Uh, <laughs> but it, I've never done anything else, and yet I'm still a very reluctant artist in that um, I... Uh, don't I, I'm very practical. I'm a Virgo and I'm very practical. And so it seems absurd to me that I'm still in show business. But I'm also a person that that thinks and sees th sees things through an artist's lens. And so and I don't realize this until I'm talking to people and they look at me as if I, you know, I'm from Neptune. So I, I I'm not good for anything else at this point. Also, I'm, you know, I'm just, I'm old, so I can't do anything else. <laughs> but anyway, but it's, it's, you know, but I, I wear that with a badge of honor because to have been in this business as long as I have and to have worked pretty consistently, um, because even when you're not working, you're working. So mm -hmm. um, I, I'm just pretty, uh, I'm I'm pretty damn grateful for that and, and very fortunate. So um, even though I'm still very reluctant and I ask myself 
why am I doing this every day? It's the life of the artist. So I want to cover so much. I'm just going to keep asking away. Keep asking. I'll, I'll keep talking. I love it. Let's dive in. So I want to ask, because I know that you're political, I know that you're wise. Uh, I, I just greatly respect you as a human. Um, so I want to ask you this question. How did you find your voice? And I mean that technically as well as spiritually. Okay, so here's 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 the here's the the secret. You always are who you are. You just um, become more of it if you are surrounded by uh, people who allow that to happen. And uh, I can honestly say there's a general consensus that I've never changed. I've only become more of myself. And now becoming more comfortable with that, uh, once again, was through naivete and, and inevitability. I mean, I literally had a horrific childhood, you know, being teased and, so, and, and that sort of thing. But I was never encouraged at home or with those who loved me or who were teaching me or encouraging me to change. So that was the interesting uh, dichotomy and uh, paradox. Uh, although I was taunted incessantly and uh, teased, uh, those who I would look to to find advice from or, or to help guide me never asked me to change. I mean, if anything, they would do things to help me, uh, to encourage me to be more like myself. For instance, um, I was so teased. Um, going to the lunchroom, that instead of me changing or to become, let's say, more accessible, more like everyone else, or butch, or more, uh, I hate using the word masculine because that doesn't mean anything to me. Um, but uh, instead of becoming someone different, my parents and my teachers and the, the secretaries at, at whatever school I was at, uh, I allowed me to eat in the teacher's lounge for four years in high school. They allowed me to eat privately. They allowed me to uh, go to the the choir room or to the band room or to the theater and have my lunch. So I was never discouraged at becoming more of myself. I was only encouraged. And because of that, uh, through evolution and age and learning, here I am. And that's the honest truth, I, I must say. I love that. And um, thank you to your teachers if they're listening. But also, sorry to you that, that you went through that. Um, but also, thank you for, <laughs> for going through yeah. that. Uh, I want to congratulate you on your HRC Visibility Award. And I also want to thank you as a gay man for your work as a change maker. You wrote and delivered, underline, 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 a legendary speech uh, for that award, and I'll include it in our links for this episode. But um, within that speech, you shared a story from Webster Conservatory about what one college professor talked to you about authenticity. Can you share that story for us here? Yes, um, that was my beloved teacher, uh, my first acting coach, actually, at Webster, Susan Gregg. She's no longer with us, but... Um, <clears throat> She was, she was delightful because what she saw in me, now that I can articulate it, was someone who was very talented, but was going to be, have, have struggles, have, uh, be conflicted with the, the norms of the business and was going to be forced to either squash or squelch uh, one's talent or be, their, be themselves and sort of wait for a period or a window where you were accepted for who you are, but you were, your, your talent was fully actualized. And so she said to me, do you want to, um, do you want to tell a lie now and be less talented? Or do you want to tell the truth now and be as talented as you possibly can be? Is basically what she said. She said, um, she said, because, you you're going to, if you start lying now you're going to have to double act but if you don't lie then you'll have to you'll get right to the juice of the character right to the juice of what you have to do and you know worry about the consequences later of someone saying oh you're too this or you're too that 
you know, um, you're not masculine enough. You're too fey. You're, I had an agent once at Writers and Artists, Artists say to me after I gave a, did a wonderful scene from Does It does a tiger wear a necktie and you know he's a drug addict and all this sort of thing and then i came and sat down and we were discussing it and i looked at her notes and it said light in the loafers and i was devastated devastated and she even said to me you're nothing like the character you just played i said well no i'm not a drug addict i'm an actor (laughs) she goes oh and i didn't understand at the time she meant that i was too gay or too s effete, if you will. Um, but, th- but, you know, I decided then, because of Susan, really, opening the window, because she was someone, yet again, that I respected, I decided then to just be myself. And uh, however that came out was fine. And I also started to realize, well, if I'm playing someone straight in a play, that doesn't make me any more legitimate if I'm playing someone gay in a play. The the point is, is the character well-written? That's it. And are you hitting your marks and getting all the beats? And so Susan Gregg was a, was a, a wonderful uh, touchstone for me that I happened to receive very early on. And so she got me on the right path to be my authentic, unique, singular self. And we get to see that in an... Whatever that is. <laughs> in a number of ways, TV, film, music, all the things, uh, and you're always dynamite. But so I know there were many other teachers at Webster, and I also know um, that you've worked with some major, major players along the way. I'm just going to drop a few names here. Will Smith, Reese Witherspoon, Ben Stiller, Will Ferrell, Lisa Kudrow, and many, many more. So Nathan, I think I know the answer to this question, but in your life, who is the number one person who's influenced you? Well, I have to say that even in high school, I was a devotee and a fan of Eartha Kitt. And so when I got a chance to actually work with her on Broadway in The Wild Party, and we became fast friends up until her dying day, that relationship I cherish so much because I can't believe that it actually happened. And I have to look at photos of us together or the signed uh, uh, publicity still that I have framed that I will be putting up eventually in my new bedroom uh, that says, to my faithful Nathan, love Eartha. Um, I say that because for all the right reasons, uh, she was a person of color who was doing things that no other person of color was doing. She was singular. She was in her own sort of wheelhouse. And everything she did spoke to me on a visceral level before I even met her. And then when I met her, of course, uh, the back of my head blew off. I mean, what do you do? And, And she thought that I was kidding when I said that I was, you know, this rabid fan of hers. And then she realized that I, I wasn't kidding because I knew some really obscure stuff, but also she saw my interactions with other people and that I wasn't sort of, you know, over the moon for, or I was very sort of measured because I quite honestly have grown up working with superstars and um, my, even as a kid. So uh, it really was about the artists themselves that impressed me the most. You know, I, I always say after meeting Sophia Loren that any other sort of femme fatale movie star pales in comparison. So, I mean, I mean, I mean there's nowhere to go but down. <laughs> so, uh, you know, with Eartha, she was so singular and so, uh, so pivotal because she did become a mentor for me um, and even when I was in Los Angeles for a stint after the wild party, I was based there for, even though I was by coast, I was based there. She kept saying to me, you know, you really should come back to New York. It's just going to be the best place for you, for a person with your talent. So I'm just saying, you know, she would call, she would call and she would leave a, a voice memo on my 
recorded message <laughs> with those little things. <laughs> and she would say, Nathan, it's Ursa. And I'm like, who else? Who else will be calling with that voice? Who else is it? I mean, you know, but she would always announce herself. And I just would always be so tickled by that. But out of respect, I erased every message because there were people who would keep her recordings and uh, misuse them or try to sell them or something like that. So I, I erased everyone. Oh, wow. I don't feel like uh, I'm worthy of, of asking this question, but I know that that relationship is really special to you. And um, at this point, if you're willing, can you share like one pivotal lesson that she taught you that you can pass on to the listener? Well, oh gosh, she did say to me, well, two things. I'll get really deep and then really sort of not so deep. She said to me that I might be alone because people like us need someone that challenges us. And she said, you might have one, two loves, but you basically will be alone because you have to do what you have to do alone. And so that was sort of ominous to me. And uh, so far that's been true. I hope that I'm, it's not a self-fulfilling prophecy, but she did say that to me. And the second thing she said to me was to always wear sunglasses morning, noon, and night. She said, it's good for your eyesight. And then I subsequently found out from my uh, eye doctor that that is true, especially when it's cloudy, um, that I should always wear sunglasses. But she said, more importantly, it keeps people at bay without you being without you having to be rude so the parameter is up but they just assume that they can't come too close so those are two things that she said to me i love it <laughs> hey, amongst amongst many things and they're like the opposite ends of the spectrum but um as we were walking uh, abba and lucy those were her beloved poodles that Zsa Zsa gabor gave her um we were walking in between shows and she had on her sunglasses and it was dusk and she said where are your sunglasses i said what do you mean you must always wear your sunglasses it keeps people at bay it's also good for your eyes and then (laughs) so that was happening on uh eighth avenue and 52nd street right outside the virginia theater which is now the august wilson only in new york these magical memories yes Okay, so yes. let's zoom out. You have an illustrious resume, the ubiquitous NLG. I do. Um, people can can Google you and find out everything, uh, and I'll include it in the intro and outro. But I'm not going to ask you to name a favorite project, but here's another tough question for you, my friend. What's one project that is really, really special to you and why? That is difficult because... Each one is special to me in some kind of way or infamous in some kind of way where I've learned a lesson. What I can say is um, I've I've done everything that I wanted to do so early that now it's more about how I feel when I'm doing something. For instance, Katie Keene. Never in a million years did I think I would have an MGM moment. (laughs) But all of a sudden, Kelly Devine is choreographing me in a number uh, for the show. And I turned to Lucy Hale and I said, oh, my God, I'm I'm uh, you're you're uh, Debbie Reynolds. And and I'm I can't remember his name uh, from uh, Mickey Rooney. No, from Singing in the Rain. Uh, I would say Gene Kelly, but it's actually the other guy. Donald O'Connor. There we go. Donald O'Connor. Yes. I said, I'm, I'm Donald O'Connor and you're uh, Debbie Reynolds in this moment. Because we did this, we had to uh, jump up and turn around at the same time and land at the same time. And it was just very sort of singing in the rain. And I, in between takes, I had a little reclimped tear moment because I said, here I am at 51 having a new experience. And I I didn't even know that I would have that. So 
it's things like that that are very special to me. Um, uh, that just things that I can recall, like for instance, when I shot Sweet Home Alabama, the confluence of me working with Gene Smart, Candace Bergen, Mary Kay Place, and us three, hang, four of us hanging out all at the same time. Now, I didn't include Reese in that because Reese and I would hang out on our own, but to have those veteran actresses all at one point in my life and me get to share with them and listen, it's things like that that really are special moments. You know, going back and doing Zoolander 2 in Rome. I literally was in Rome for 40 days and 40 nights with everyone. So I'm sitting in the makeup trailer next to Benedict Cumberbatch, and then I feel a hand on my shoulder as Will Ferrell is in the other seat. And um, he says, hello, mate. And I, I said, who is that? And I look up and it's Sting. So it's just those moments like that that are... Um, that are most impressive to me on each project because I'm really trying to be present for each one. Uh, and so they're all special to me in some kind of way. There's never really been some sort of breakout moment for me. Cause I don't think of myself and I don't think of my career in terms of breakout. I think of it just as a continuation. Some people would say, Oh, you know, for instance, when I did LA to Vegas, um, that was such a special moment because it happened so quickly. It happened while I was on stage doing the view upstairs that I shot that pilot. So those two things were happening at the same time. They both were very special. Um, I flew out to LA to do Los Angeles to do uh, that series. And the five people that were on that show, or I guess the six of us really, um, were so special and it was such a special experience and we all got along so well that I would trade it for nothing. Even though the series didn't get picked up for a second season, we were a mid season replacement and we shot 15 episodes. You don't shoot 15 episodes for regular seasons. So it was just special all around, you know, um, each, each one of these projects has been special to me for some reason on its own and I, I'm so sorry that was such a long answer but it's the truth and then the, all of those moments are earned it's like it's like reflecting back to you all of the the work that you've put in yeah Nathan you've led many a show many a project many a company um, what are your biggest lessons in leadership okay here's the thing um, the business is very subjective so uh I've seen people come and I've seen them go. I've seen them burn bright as a comet and then just like a comet, burn out. What's mostly impressive to me is consistency and discipline. This is what I learned at Webster. Consistency and discipline. It's my reputation on every set and every show that I do. And to go along with that, my advice to students it's really, really simple, and you would be amazed how many don't do it, which is show up on time, know your line, hit your mark, and don't be an asshole. <laughs> you would be amazed how many of those things, how those four things, those four uh, pillars are not heated on a regular basis. You would be amazed by that. Yeah. Show up on, sh showing up on time, you know, be on time. Right. Know your line, hit your mark. Um, it doesn't mean that you won't flub a line, but it, people can tell the difference between you knowing a line and flubbing it than not knowing it at all. And you cannot be an asshole because your reputation does precede you. And I can tell you, there are certain people that I will never work with again. Mm. And I will tell people who ask me about them that they shouldn't hire them. But the key is those people have no idea that I feel that way about them. 
So, Nathan, I also know that you are quite politically engaged and always informed. Um, and bouncing off this about not being an asshole, uh, being a, a key pillar of leadership, can you talk about how you're handling the world that we're currently living in? Well, I will say that everything's absurd and sort of turned upside down, topsy turvy. And when that happens, you have to recalibrate on a daily basis with things that uh, are positive. There's going to be a negative road all the time, but if you start off with something that's positive, I feel as though that sort of sets you up to be able to take the good and the bad because you have to be informed, but at the same time, you cannot be, uh, drowned in it so you have to be you have to check in you have to check it's important to check in but then you have to have some brevity and so what i do is i check in all the time it's so funny over the last two weeks because i haven't had my television set up and i haven't really been watching my hulu on the laptop because i've been either working or unpacking um it's been a nice break for me, but I've also realized that not knowing is not good either. So there's a good, you have to take a, have a good balance and be well informed about things. Uh, and sort of drill down to find out what the truth is and the facts. So if you could sort of do a poo-poo platter of, different outlets to find out what's happening and then go with your gut. I think it's important um, just to keep yourself well-informed, but not drown in it. Mm -hmm. You know, as my mother always says, deal, don't dwell. I like that advice. So, you know, deal with things, but don't dwell on them. Yeah. Uh, just dipping here quickly, um, you mentioned, you know, hearing from a lot of different sources and making your own opinion. And so I, I do want to talk about sort of social media, um, this idea that everyone is putting out a story. And can you share your take on what what 2020 means for the world at large in terms of digital media, but then also how you engage with with that social aspect on a day to day basis? Well, it's kind of peculiar and kind of funny because of my, because of my generation, because of my age, and because I uh, was born into an analog, analog world, and, and now I am in a digital world with everyone else, I do have this weird sort of struggle from time to time. Also, because of the nature of my career at this point, uh, it's a constant... Uh, struggle and a give and take for me, how I engage social media because, and it's a delicate balance because I don't have to do certain things that other people who are younger than me have to do. Uh, Meryl Streep does not have to be on social media at all. Touche. She just doesn't have to do it. So there's a part of me that doesn't have to do it because I'm not going to be hired based upon how many followers I have because I have an established career and I'm old. So, and so that's a plus because I don't have to do as much. Now I do have to participate when said company said network said production company, um, asks me to do things. So, that's still a challenge for me to live tweet because I'd rather watch the show than miss something and by live tweeting. But what's good about that is that people don't usually watch something when it airs anyway because it's all over the place. I don't either. My queue is way too long and I don't have time to watch things when they actually air. So I am a, definitely a part of the community when it comes to things like that. Instagram. It's funny. Uh, I sometimes will pick up more followers the less I post because I feel like people find that, that because I'm not posting as much, 
they find it intriguing because they actually know that I'm busy. But there are people who grew up in this digital Instagram world exclusively. And so it is a part of their DNA to post every day. Um, what I've come to, to find out is that I accept my relationship with social media and I embrace it the best way that I can without becoming stressed about it so that it becomes something that's enjoyable um, instead of uh, purely a chore. Now, for some people, Instagram actually is a job. But for me, it's an enhancer. It's uh, a window into some of my private life. I am old school, and so I find it intriguing to have a, an actual private life and for there to be some sort of mystery. I'm that person that doesn't want to see you before a show um, so that I don't ruin the illusion of what's about to happen. And I like that. I think that's a part of my social media mystique that I don't post all the time and that when I do, it's something fun or something pivotal or something interesting. I remember being in Puerto Vallarta this past New Year's and I thought, I'll do only black and white clothing and I'll document it. It'll be my editorial story for my trip. Well, on the third, come the third day, I was so exhausted from being Annie Leibovitz. And, uh, you know, I, I was just like, oh my God, I can't take another picture of myself. And I mean, and I just can't do it. I'm not enjoying myself because there was, I only brought black and white. So I literally was changing into black and white clothing constantly. And I was changing three to four times a day because of bathing suits and uh, going out to dinner and my pajamas were black and white. And then, I, you know, I said, oh God, I'm going to, so what I decided to do was upload sort of a collage of a couple of looks and post those over a period of three to four days and say, that's enough. I love it. But see, I reconciled myself with it. I had, I had fun. I did what I said I was going to do. But then I also enjoyed my life and I stopped taking pictures of myself. How do you measure success after, after all of your credits and awards? Hmm. That's a hard question to answer. I guess, how do I measure success? Um, I suppose I measure it by actually enjoying what I do. People say, uh, people use the wrong word when they ask me how a role is going. Are you having fun? Fun is for children. Fun is for playgrounds. I'm doing a job. It's enjoyable. Enjoyable is the right word for a working adult actor. And I think I measure success by how much I'm enjoying the process, how much I'm enjoying the job that I'm actually doing. And I've, I'm so fortunate to be, uh, you know, sort of heady and es uh, eccentric and esoteric and, you know, and I can have my granola hemp moments because I'm afforded to do so. And I guess that, that is success. Um, also, I feel successful because I've never, I've never felt the need to be com uh, in competition with anyone except myself. So that's a measure of success too. I'm very comfortable in my own skin and I'm very comfortable on my own track. When people say to me, oh, Nathan, um, this is going to be really big for you. I say to them, what are you talking about? Because I honestly don't understand that concept. I've always felt every job was the same. Now, some, may, some jobs may be higher profile than others. Uh, some people may see if I'm doing a show off Broadway downtown, not as many people are going to see that if I'm on national television. But I approach every job the same way. So I'm always gobsmacked when people say things like, oh, well, this is going to be really big for you. And I'm, I'm like, oh, sure, uh, okay. Uh, I don't, I've never understood that concept. Or um, I love you in that show. I can't wait to see you do more. I can't wait to see how, that, how you blossom. I'm like, what I'm doing right now is enough. 
I'm there. Do you know how, how hard it is to land a uh, Broadway show within these few city blocks? Do you know how difficult it is to get a great off-Broadway show? Do you know how incredibly hard it is to be in a feature film? And do you know how exceptional it is to be on national television in a role? All of these things are very coveted and very difficult to get. So if you see my black ass on television or on the stage, be happy for me and let's move on. Don't want more. Want what is. Ooh, she's dropping the tea today. <laughs> well, what I is have... is enough. Yes, queen. I have a follow-up question for that, uh, for when something has been really big. Um, can you pinpoint a, a specific award or a specific review, some sort of recognition that has has been that moment of the Klempt for you? Um, and why was it that those words or, or that particular award, why was that so special? Well, I must tell you, I don't read reviews. And uh, Eartha told me not to, so I stopped. Um, the last one I read, the last one I read when I was reading reviews, I believe was in 1998, and I was doing Jesus Christ Superstar in Nyack with Billy Porter and Emily Skinner. Emily, po- Emily Skinner was playing Mary. Billy was playing Jesus. And I think this was directed by Gordon Greenberg. And uh, I was playing King Herod. And who else was in that production? Oh, uh, someone with non-equity who's... Uh, he did Jekyll and Hyde, and he was on American Idol. What's his name? Constantine Maroulis. Yes. He, yes, he was non-equity at the time. And uh, tons of wonderful people in that show. Uh, I remember the New York Times came up to review it because it was so close, and it was such a pivotal uh, show. And uh, it was an excellent, excellent production that I believe Tim Rice even saw and really loved. Um, Andrew Lloyd Webber would not allow it to come to the Broadway, jealous much. But um, but uh, the review said, uh, the definitive rendering of Herod. The definitive rendering of King Herod. I thought, well, I'm not going to ever get a better review than that. And that happened to be the last review that I read. Now, subsequently... Um, I do have friends who let me know, uh, they let me know if a review is good or bad. And I've been very fortunate not to have any bad reviews over the years, because let me tell you, the children will let you know if it's bad. Um, (laughs) But people do know that I don't read them. So what they'll do is stereotypically, I can't speak. Um, um, They will let me know, you know, on the sly well, so-and-so said this and -and so-and-so said that. And then my publicist, uh, my theatrical publicist, Dan Fortune, will send me uh, reviews, um, but marked danger. Don't open until show has closed. So what I've become accustomed to is like several years later, like for instance, I just recently read the reviews for Wig Out that was done at the Vineyard uh, Terrell Allen McCraney's uh, play, Wig Out, that was directed by Tina Landau, which I was nominated for a Drama League, I believe, and some other awards. But Drama League is what I remember. Outer Critics? Yeah, something like this. I remember going to the Drama League uh, reception, and uh, I was at the, in a bathroom stall, and Elton John came up right next to me and said, I love your work. And I couldn't tell if he was looking down at my penis or he was commenting on the wig out. But I just went to Fantasyland and was like, thank you, Rocket Man. Um, so, uh, and that's just an aside. I was also sitting near Angela Lansbury, I believe, that year. Uh, so funny. I met Angela Lansbury at Joe Allen's. Eartha introduced me to, to, uh, to Angela. She goes, um, Angie, I think she called her Angie, maybe Angela. This is Nathan. Nathan, meet Angela. And then, of course, uh, my eyes popped out of my head and I was just like, okay, whatever. Because that is another career that I think is singular and she's one of my favorites. And of course, she, like Eartha, is an anomaly. She looks the way she looks. No one looks like her. 
no one's like her. She's done everything. Um, she's ubiquitous. She's wonderful. I love Angela Lansbury. So anyway, I got off track, but uh, what was I talking about? What were we saying? Your definitive rendering is this this pivotal oh, moment. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's the so that's the last one. So Ursula told me to stop reading reviews. I don't. But I did just recently read some reviews from Wig Out, and that happened in 2008, okay? Um, that show was very important to me because it was my return to the stage. I hadn't been on stage in quite some time, and I was going through uh, a very toxic relationship with my then boyfriend, uh, who's a very nice guy, and I, of course, wish him well. Uh, but... I had been in New York for a while and it was my return to the stage. I was terrified to be on stage again because I didn't know if I could do it. And uh, it turned out to be a huge milestone and turning point in my career uh, because I returned to the stage and realized that I could do everything. I used to really, really bug me that, I felt like I was a jack of all trades and a master of nothing because I would be on the set or I would be on the stage or I would be doing a concert or I would be on a film. And everybody in, in these different mediums would look at me as if I were new because I kept going to each one. And then I suddenly realized, oh, you're actually a master of all of them, bitch. That's all. It's okay to travel. It's okay to, to be, I'm not new. I just don't know these people, but you know, I, I've worked at the top of my game in each medium, I, can, I happily say. And it's yeah. been a joy. Nathan, we have to cruise to the end, but there's so many questions I want to squeeze in. So um, if, if I may, I'm just going to keep firing keep away. Yes. Okay. So what is one failure that you can recall uh, that really taught you something? One, one big like, oh. yeah. Okay, great. Um, I don't believe in failure and I'm not being esoteric. I do not believe in failure. Once you've tried something and had follow through, um, I believe that it may not turn out the way you want it, but that's not a failure. It just didn't turn out the way you wanted it to. So it leads you to something else. Uh, a very dear friend and colleague asked me why I would do Priscilla, Queen of the Desert. Why would you play, why would you go backwards and do a featured ensemble role? And I said to him, well, I needed the job. I wanted the money. And I needed to move back to New York. And I needed to get out of my relationship that I had in Los Angeles. When I told them the truth, it arrested them. It absolutely gobsmacked them. Mind you, they weren't working. <laughs> Me, for. But, um, you know... It, 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 it put them in their place. So uh, that's my real answer. I do not believe in failure. If you see something all the way to the end, you haven't failed. If it turns out to be something else, then that's what, that was what was supposed to happen. So failure is not in my vocabulary. Um, to have tried something and it turned out differently is simply you have tried something and it turned out differently. There are many people listening and some of them are young and some of them are colleagues. So you've covered a lot. There's been some really just amazing gems in here. But is there anything that you would say, if you could, to someone at your level, just like the, the truth bomb that they need to hear? What would be your advice to a veteran or a celebrity artist from Nathan Lee Graham? Calm down. Ooh. That's it. I mean, listen, that, that encompasses so many things. That encompasses so many things. Whatever your mantra is, you need to calm down. Calm down that internal clock. Calm down. It will be the best thing for you. It will keep you alive and well. It will keep you consistent and well. It will keep you focused and well. You must calm the internal clock down. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's, so the clock is ticking, and I do want to ask you, this is a podcast about change-making. So from your experience in all areas of the industry, 
what changes would you like to see in the future of arts and entertainment? Listen, you know, I don't know why I'm on this kick, but I am. I would love for casting agents to give actors of a certain note, a, you know, certain veterans, their due. And what I mean by that is have a little bit more value in the resume. I would love for that to happen. I would love to, for that sort of moment to happen where there was a, where we could squeeze time together, where we could close the gap, the donut hole between being hired and your resume. Certain things you shouldn't have to go in for anymore. Certain things you should be offered. Now, mind you, I'm offered a lot of things, but there's certain things you go in for that are so repetitive. And yes, you're being called in because you probably have done this, but I, I would love for the casting agent, the good casting agent, to sort of go, you know what? I'm just going to put this person on a short list and this will go you know, straight to offer. Because that would, that would make everybody involved feel so much better about themselves. We have to go in and repeat things over and over again as an artist of note or as a veteran. It gets to be very worrisome. It gets to be, you, you start to second guess yourself. You're like, I've already proven I can do this in, in real time. Now, if you haven't been around and you've done something, you know, and it's been years, that's different. But I would love the gap, the donut hole for casting agents to be a little bit shortened. I love it. That's the truth. Uh, and I, I already have clients in mind who I'm like, yeah, I definitely, I definitely know what you're talking about. So taking a larger lens, looking at either our country or the, the entire world, um, if you could wave your magical wand and make change, what would you like to see change in the world? Right now, to be quite honest, is this administration. You know, it's just, uh, the fish really does rot from the head. And it's just, it's just so overwhelmingly negative. Even if you're getting things done, but you're getting them done in a negative way, that's not, it's, it's just, we're all at a low level depression. There's a low grade of depression. Um, because even people who voted for this person in the White House currently, you cannot tell me that they want constant chaos. You cannot tell me that they want constant ridicule and to live under this sort of heavy weight this heavy uh, murky mire, this drudgery. Um, it's just not fun. It's like growing up in abuse, an abusive household where at any moment, something's going to set someone off. Someone's going to set daddy off. You're all walking on eggshells and everyone's smiling and going through the motions and going to work and doing all the things. But at any moment, you're going to be called a name or made fun of or cheated on or not paid or persecuted or you know so i would love for this administration to change because it's so toxic dangerous and negative i agree so with that i thank you for all that you shared with us today what is the best way to get connected with you nathan through my agent Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god i'm so old school call my press agent um, um but honestly i i it's things don't seem legit to me unless you call my agent but but um i do respond to you know occasionally i will respond to a dm on the instagram and uh because that's the easiest that's the sort of fastest way um if you don't have my personal stuff which you shouldn't uh but you know dms through that and i get some weird stuff tony so i do not answer everything because one shouldn't but you know if there's some sort of job opportunity or job question it's best to call carlton goddard and freer cgf talent um because they know all of my business and they have my entire calendar. We love them. Yes, we love them. 
Nathan, thank you for being here. And again, thank you for all of your work, both on stage, online, on screen, but but more importantly, like who you are as a human. Um, so to close us out, I want you to take a moment and think, what is one final thought for the listener of how they can create change in the world? What immediately comes to mind is being your authentic self. Because when you are that, unless you're a serial, serial killer, when you are that, your authentic self, um, and, you, and you don't dim your light, the world is brighter. It's just brighter. But if you're not your authentic self and you're constantly sort of dimming your light, you know, metaphorically to make someone else feel better or to compensate or, you know, if everyone's lights are on, then everyone gets, a, uh, everyone can see and everyone gets a chance. As my sister say, as my sister says, to have their step out, their step out moment, you know, um, so being your authentic self, it all comes back to authentic, authenticity. I can't speak this morning because I've been up for 24 hours, but it all comes back to authenticity because uh, when you are your authentic self, people can intrinsically feel that energy. Energy is palpable. Energy is real. So try to be that. Try to find who that is as soon as you possibly can and just become more of it. I always say, whoever you are, whatever you are, become more of it. And I mean that. Uh, because it's just a better world when everyone can be themselves. Whatever pronoun that is, my pronouns are Nathan and Diva. <laughs> and on that note, we will call it an interview. Thank you so much, Nathan, for being on the show and thank you for listening. I want to highlight just a few things that Nathan shared. The first, the big idea is just be yourself. You're going to hear it a lot of different times, a lot of different ways, but I like the way that Nathan says it. Whatever you are, whoever you are, become more of you. Be that singular sensation. I also love his rules. Show up on time, know your lines, hit your mark, and don't be an asshole. And if you're not a performer and you're listening to this, just find your equivalent of knowing your lines and hitting your mark. And finally, perhaps maybe the most important thing in the times that we're living in, calm down. Calm the internal clock that is telling you that you should be farther along or that there's not enough time to keep yourself well. I know that Nathan and I would both love to hear your takeaways, your favorite moments. So take a screenshot of this episode right now and share your biggest takeaway with he and I on social media. You can tag Nathan Lee Graham and Tony Howell. If you want to hear more conversations with our change makers, be sure to check out the other episodes on your podcatcher of choice. And of course, I would love it if you would subscribe and love you even more if you would leave a review. For all things Nathan Lee Graham, just go to NathanLeeGraham.com or follow him on social media at Nathan Lee Graham. Of course, I would love it if you would hop over to TonyHowell.me. We have a digital wellness quiz to grade your online presence. And in the weeks ahead, we're doing some completely free training on how to build your own personal website. So definitely hop over to TonyHowell.me. And if you click on the link in the episode description, you'll also find lots of bonus resources for this conversation, including Nathan's performances and his acceptance speech for the HRC Visibility Award. Thank you so much for listening to Conversations with Changemakers, but more importantly, thank you for the work that you do. Please continue to go out there, even if it's just online, and use your work to change the world. Maybe you and I can have a conversation about it very soon.